Okay, so we're going to start today with pulmonary pathology, particularly for pediatrics and with the pediatric focus here. Get the share screen going on. All right, so from a pediatric perspective, we'll go through pulmonology. It's a good idea if you follow along with this book. You guys are going to hate this book by the end, but this uh, pulmonary section of the certification and recertification for physician's assistants, it's nice to go along, and uh, as you get certain pathologies, you can pause your zoom video and then you can kind of research those things so that as the video is taking you through these you're also getting a taste for it for what the review book really wants you to know so that's a smart way to study and will optimize your time okay so there's definitely some anatomy differences between pediatric patients and our adult patients particularly with the upper airway so this is really important stuff to know about pediatric patients and why they can go south on us really fast. So they have a smaller nasopharynx, so easily prone to infection. They're um, in the pediatric population before two years old. Their immune system is not as robust. They have a small oral cavity, floppy epiglottitis, or epiglottis that is prone to epiglottitis. Um, their thyroid and cricoid um, are immature. They have more cartilaginous tissue um, that's not as thick and can easily be flexed. Um, fewer muscles to help with compensation um, and to protect them from trauma. So here's the upper airway. This is a big difference, right? So the child's airway is much smaller. The, the tongue takes up a greater proportionality of the mouth the pharynx is smaller, the epiglottis is larger and floppier, and the larynx is more anterior. The narrowest portion of the cricoid is much more narrow than the adult, and the thyroid, the trachea narrows and is less rigid. So basically, long story short, there's narrowing at the cricoid. It's a very important feature to understand. This is a common spot for foreign airway obstructions to lodge. And in particular, if they get a foreign airway that goes past this point, it's gonna end up in the right bronchus, right? The reason why endotracheal tube, for instance, and peds sizes are much smaller. So the ET tube is basically two to five and are uncuffed. So approach to wheezing in the pediatric patient. So the approach to wheezing is this musical high-pitched noise mainly on expiration so it's going to sound like this <sighs> right in the lungs you'll hear that it's kind of a girly sound that i made there but that's the point is that those you're basically forcing air over these tightened airways and you get this wheezing sound so there's impaired airflow due to narrowing you may want to consider some differential diagnoses here so i would say Definitely infectious process, um, increased sputum production, acute bronchitis, bronchiolitis, epiglottitis, all your itises, right? Asthma, especially with pediatric patients. So there is a approach to wheezing. Um, the differential diagnoses for the infant less than 12 months are here, your big bolded causes are the most common. I don't know, anytime I bold something, I would probably wanna remember that, particularly if I'm a student. So bronchiolitis is a big deal with little kids, uh, all ages of children, but uh, particularly young children. Uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. <clears throat> so this is just a congenital abnormality that is very common. Um, in the blue italics, these may present, but usually present with strider, <laughs> not a wheeze. So this would be foreign body aspiration, laryngotracheal 
Ecclesia, that got cut off there. Vascular ring or sling, high wear, airway hemangioma, and laryngeal web. So a lot of things to think about. I wouldn't get caught in the weeds on those, but you need to know these big ones, particularly bronchiolitis is a very testable question. Um, the approach to wheezing is we want to start thinking about differentials, right? So as children age, the differentials change a little bit from one year to four years old. It could be a viral induced wheezing. Really, this spans the spectrum of the ages, but this is like some categories that you can start dropping things into and make a little bit more sense of it. Asthma, form body aspiration for these little guys. Community acquired pneumonia, also known as CAP. Inherited disorders like cystic fibrosis and immunodeficiency. So primarily in your one to four year old, you're gonna get viral induced wheezing and asthma. In your five to 12 year olds, you're gonna have more of an asthmatic. They can also have vocal cord dysfunction, community acquired pneumonia, cystic fibrosis, immunodeficiency. So lots of crossover here, but the real take home is your older kids are wheezers. They're probably asthmatics. Your little kids could have a viral induced uh, wheezing, which from age zero to two, you're probably looking at RSV. So the approach to wheezing as we get older, the adolescents age 13 to 18, primarily asthma or vocal cord dysfunction. There could be some hypersensitivity pneumonitis, so just inflammation of the lung tissue secondary to hypersensitivity. Uncommonly, you could have some pulmonary edema, uh, congestive heart failure, tuberculosis, and a mass compressing the airway. Approach to wheezing with historical findings. So when did the child start to wheeze? Is there a pattern of wheezing? Is it episodic? Does it come or go? Or has it per persistent since the onset? This is going to help elicit the cause. Is this new or recurrent? We kind of alluded to that up above. Are there any identifiable identifiable triggers like environmental allergens? Was there some sort of fever, nasal congestion, um, rhinorrhea, viral upper respiratory infection, any environmental allergens? How about if they're exercising? Exercise-induced asthma is a big one or maybe when they're feeding if they're an infant. So another thing we should think about in the history is what makes it worse, what makes it better? Oh, it responds to albuterol, okay? So most likely, Smooth muscle, um, smooth muscle contraction that is relieved with the albuterol causing bronchodilation, which would be more likely an asthma. In infants, we want to ask about the relationship to wheezing and their feeding. This could in indicate reflux. It could also rarely indicate a H type of tracheoesophageal fistula. That would be a really good pickup if you found that out. Associated medical problems, so is there a history of prematurity? Was this a little tiny baby? Were they born at 26 weeks or less? Is there a bronchopulmonary dysplasia? History of cardiomegaly or cardiopulmonary disorders in the family? Difficulty gaining weight or frequent infections? History of GERD? History of ATP? What's ATP? Well, ATP is this beautiful triad, and you guys know I love triads. <clears throat> A to B is the triad of asthma, um, <clears throat> allergies, and eczema. Okay, so that's that A to P. Good, moving on. So approach to wheezing, overall we wanna look at the, the appearance. Is this child sick or not sick? That will be hammered into your head. What does a sick child look like? Well, they're tripoding, they're breathing, and they could be drooling. We want to assess their respiratory rate, how sick or not sick is this child? What is their oxygen saturation? Are they using accessory muscles for movement? Are they fighting to breathe? We are worried about this child. If they are there, these kids can go very south very quickly, so we need to be mindful of this child. This is the child that you follow back to the room as they come into your emergency room. <clears throat> Approach to the wheezing infant. So we need to do a good cardiovascular exam. We need to assess heart rate, rhythm, pulses, and capillary refill. We wanna look for any signs of congestive heart failure. We need to see if there's a displaced point of maximal impulse. We wanna assess for any hepatomegaly. We need to assess for peripheral edema and jugular venous distension. And good luck with this one. 
uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but difficult to do on kids. All right, so approaches to wheezing, we wanna look at some um, kind of generalized assessment and observation of this patient. Are they hydrated? What's their skin turner? Are they, do they have that allergic stigmata, which is that nasal salute, that little crease across the nasal passage? Um, do they have allergic shiners, these kind of darkening circles under the eyes bilaterally? Is there evidence of chronic process such as failure to thrive? Digital clubbing, which would be seen in cystic fibrosis. Um, that would have to be long term. It may indicate significant underlying disease, like, oh, look at that, cystic fibrosis. Good. Approach to weeding. So we can do some laboratory values. We definitely want to get a good set of vital signs on this patient. We can do rapid viral antigen testing to try to elicit a cause or a viral etiology check pulmonary functioning tests on kids that are greater than five years old. We can do some allergy testing as well. How about radiographic appearance? So we can do a chest x-ray. We can look at the PA and lateral views. What are those once again? So a PA is going from with having the sheet here, the um, x-ray film behind the patient. Here's the patient, okay? And this is why they call it a PA, okay, just like physician assistant. So, and then you're going to take the picture is going to actually, sorry, I'm totally backwards. The picture is going to be this way. For, so from the posterior portion of the, pic, of the patient and you capture here. So if this is their back, so this is their butt, okay? So you've got, you're shooting the x-ray through their back and capturing it here. So they call that a PA, right? So posterior to anterior. And then your lateral view is actually looking through the patient at the lateral view. Uh, chest x-ray is generally not indicated in known asthmatic children or with suspected asthma exacerbations, right? We, we already know what's going on here. We don't need to belabor that with a chest x-ray. We may actually get that later, but this is not part of our initial workup. Airway film, so AP and lateral soft tissue of the neck. If we've got some strider or we're concerned that there may be some sort of etiology in the upper airway, we should also perform those. So things that we can see in a soft neck film, we can see steeple sign, uh, which would be indicative of um, some narrowing there, or we can also see an epiglottitis. Um, the steeple sign is seen in croup. Epiglottitis has a different, that's called the thumbprint sign with epiglottitis. Now we'll talk about these later. And then also we could see a pneumomediastinum. So air in between the mediastinum and the upper airway. All right, so the approach to wheezing. So we want to do, um, we may need to assess these patients right away. This is a film here that shows some airway obstruction, right? This is our uh, a patient with, this is, oh, sorry, this is a barium swallow or magnetic imaging, which is looking for an intrinsic airway compression, right? So this is closing off the airway here. We can also look for bronchiectasis or other anatomic abnormalities that may cause choking off of the esophagus. So this is some sort of a foreign body in the airway that is choking off the esophagus here. And this is one of those barium swallow magnetic resonance imaging films that we can see that. So you can see the spine here, you can see the rib film, and then we see this projection which is most likely coming from the esophagus. Looks like we've got a foreign body that's obstructing, uh, that's obstructing from the esophagus into the airway itself. So the approach to wheezing and other diagnostics, well, diagnostic trail of inhaled albuterol. So that always kind of points us toward what the probable diagnosis is. Maybe um, 
diagnosable as well as therapeutic. So if we have a child that comes in with wheezing and we do an uh, albuterol treatment and the wheezing improves, they're better able to move air and they're not using that accessory muscle use, then we can with good certainty assume that that was probably asthmatic. Further evaluation may be indicated with chronic cases or more profound cases, but we can also do an arterial blood gas. We can do di direct laryngobronchoscopy where we actually go down there with a camera and we want to visualize the structures. Um, approach to the wheezing patient. So we're always gonna think about our ABCs, right? Airway, blood, and then uh, airway breathing and circulation, right? So. Um, how's the airway look? Are they getting air in? Are they working too hard to breathe? And are they circulating well? Meaning are the extremities perfused? We want to correct any hypoxemia that we might find. We want to correct that right away. And we want to ensure that the pa patient gets the appropriate level of care. Secondary therapy um, differs from the, depending on what the etiology may be. This depends on the degree of respiratory distress associated findings and what we find from our workup. So let's talk about Strider. So Strider is this variable harsh pitch monophonic pitch sound caused by the passage of airway through a narrow tube. So that's your, that's a Strider. Sign of upper airway obstruction. This is not a diagnosis. This is a subjective thing that we're seeing on physical exam. So you can't diagnose someone with Strider, you need to explain why they have Strider. Strider can be both inspiratory and expiratory, or it can be biphasic. So they might have Strider when they inhale and Strider when they exhale. Location of the respiratory cycle can help determine the size of the obstruction. So let's talk about this, obstruction in the extrathoracic airways, okay? So here's our locations. Extrathoracics mean out of the thoracic cavity, could be in the thoracic cavity or intrathoracic in the trachea. Anatomical location could be supraglottic, epiglottic, somewhere in the vocal cords or in the larynx. Then in the thoracic inlet, you can get glottic, subglottic, extrathoracic and thoracic inlet. This is all just a little bit too complicated, but I want you guys to be aware that we can isolate these based on some of the pathophysiology. So there may be an inspiratory strider caused by loose supporting structures that collapse with inspiration. So that's where you could have an epiglottitis causing a strider, and that's because that um, tracheal tissue or that and that epiglottic tissue is so swollen that as air goes by that it's making that harsh strider sound. Um, if it's a thoracic inlet obstruction it's going to be rigidal, ri it's a rigid non-collapsible tube that when it is obstructed it causes a fixed basic biphasic strider. So strider in, strider out with a intra thoracic tracheal obstruction you're going to hear during inspiration. The negative intrathoracic pressure maintains the integrity during expiration. So only heard during inspiration. These I don't think are all at high yield. I would probably not be able to utilize these to try to isolate where the obstruction is, but they're good to know that they exist. The approach to Strider, well, we want to do a differential diagnosis. These are the things that it could be, and these are the things that you should maybe stop right now and get into your review book. So croup. Now, what's the most common cause of croup? You guys need to know that because that's a very testable question. Also, if it's acute onset, these folks are going to be sick, right? They're going to look sick as stink, especially someone with a peritonsillar abscess or epiglottitis, right? So what causes croup? You need to look that up in your book, okay? Do it yourself because I'm not gonna tell you. No, I'm just kidding. Parainfluenza causes croup, but you should also look that up and have a good idea of some of the distinguishing features. 
There's also peritonsillar abscess or retroferritoneal abscess. This is generally caused by a strep throat infection. Epiglottitis can be caused from lots of infections, but rarely can be caused from Haemophilus influenza B. Also with an acute onset and no sign of a disease state or infectious process, you can get foreign body aspiration can cause acute onset strider. Anaphylaxis can cause acute onset strider. Hypocalcemic tetany can cause acute onset strider and so can caustic ingestion or thermal burns. When you ingest a toxin or you have a thermal burn, you have swelling of the upper airway secondary to the insult causing some strider. Chronic causes often result from an anatomic aberration like laryngeomalacia, tracheomalacia. These are all um, softening of the larynx and the trachea or malformation. You can have vocal cord dysfunction, subglottic stenosis, mediastinal mass, or a hemangioma that is in the upper airway. These are going to be a different history, right? This is going to be a chronic problem. So approach to Strider, we want to ask about any birth complications, if there was any need for intubation when the child was born, what was the age of onset, the relationship of Strider with feeding and body position, the voice quality of the patient, and the associated symptoms. The approach to Strider is to um, differentiate the age of the patient. We need to think about laryngeomalacia and tracheomalacia and subglottic stenosis usually present in the first few weeks of life. So if we're talking about a two-year-old, this is not on our differential. Foreign body aspiration, generally seen in infants older than six months, because these are children that can put things in their mouth. Croup is generally occurring in children between six months and three years. Retropharyngeal retrofer abscess is usually in preschool aged children and peritonsillar abscesses are more likely in chil older children and adolescents. So nothing you can really hang your hat on there, but just some things that you can kind of put in the back of your brain so that you can know what type of patient and at what age you're dealing with them. We also want to know, was this child hospitalized when they were born? Were they in the neonatal care um, center where they are born or did they were they premature because a premature infant doesn't have fully developed lungs and is more prone to some of these um, anatomical abnormalities we'll also want to ask about a history of patent ductus arteriosus because um, this can be a cause also if there's vocal cord dysfunction in the child this could be a sign that they had a patent ductus that was ligated and the vocal cord was damaged during that process. When did the symptoms begin and have they gotten any worse? Acute onset in a toddler with no other respiratory infection, symptoms or a choking event that was witnessed should suggest foreign body, right? Oh, I don't know, all of a sudden he started with this strider. Well, we need to think about foreign body in this. Um, acute onset of URI preceding the strider, we want to really think about croup. Kids die of croup all the time. Acute onset when a patient was exposed to an allergen, we want to think about allergic reaction. Um, there can be structural problems if this was coming from the time that they were born. And if the symptoms are worsening and they're getting older, it may suggest a growing laryngotracheal hemangioma. Um, are there any associated symptoms? Okay, so fever is going to suggest an infectious etiology. If they notice that the child put something in their mouth, right, that's going to um, suggest foreign body aspiration. If they can't make any noise, we're going to think about vocal cord paralysis or some sort of neural problem. If there's urticaria or emesis, we want to think about an allergic reaction. Does anything seem to make the strider worse? 
Strider that is worse when crying or placed supine and improved with prone placement is typically seen in laryngeomalacia. You guys didn't even know laryngeomalacia it existed until today. So thanks for that, right, Professor? All right, so rapid assessment of degree of the airway obstruction is absolutely imperative, right? So A, airway is the A in our ABCs. We need to keep that in mind. We wanna look for symptoms of distress, like mental status that's awkward, the child's not behaving right, they're tripoding, they're drooling, they're hypoxic, their fingers are blue, that's bad juju. Are they working to breathe? Children are, are worrisome because they'll keep this up for a while, but eventually they'll run out of energy and you're in deep doo-doo. Note the strider quality and the timing assess for symmetry in the respiratory exam. So do they have a pneumothorax? And then note any factors that aggregate or alleviate the strider. We want to uh, support our diagnostics with our physical exam. So cough, congestion, rhinorrhea, we're thinking croup, drooling, trismus, turtle colis, can't move your neck, you got a peritonsillar abscess or a retropharyngeal abscess, gray pseudomembrane cover the tonsils. This is consistent with diphtheria, especially in an unimmunized child. If there's lip swelling or hives, we want to think of anaphylaxis. And if there's hemangios on the skin, particularly like a beard distribution, we want to think of an airway hemangioma, right? One of these things is not like the others, but there are other things that might lead us to that diagnosis or at least to consider that. So here's diphtheria. Ooh, that looks like it hurts. That is very consistent with not being vaccinated, but it's this white and black pseudomembrane on the back of the throat. And that is called, but caused by a bacterium called diphtheria. We don't see that a lot, but we need to think about that in the migrant population or people who recently came to this country because they are at risk. Uh, radiologic testing for Strider, not routinely needed, but focused evaluation may make you do one. You need to watch for that Stiepelstein. Um, we should do some laboratory testing. If we've got a toxic appearing patient, if we've got a sick person, we want to start thinking of bacterial tracheitis or epiglottitis, in which case we definitely need to get this patient some labs done, we wanna check a CBC, which is going to show a left shift. A left shift means that you have neutrophils that are normally developing and they're going down this developmental path and they start like this with this big schmutzy nucleus. And then that nucleus soon starts to turn into what they call a band. And then that band eventually lobulates into about six different lobes. That's a mature neutrophil. So mature neutrophils usually are what we kick out into the circulation. So these are usually sequestered in the bone marrow. But if you're having a really, really bad infection, you'll start kicking out cells early. And when you start kicking out these bands or um, immature neutrophils, they call that a left shift meaning that this, as we look at these cells, it goes from left to right. So from immature to mature, with the most immature being on the left. So anytime we shift to the left, that is not the same as a neutrophilia. Lots of people get that twisted, but not as a med tech. We've been taught by a med tech, so you won't screw that up. But left shifts means immaturity. If you spike your neutrophils, that's still considered something that we want to think about for bacterial infection, particularly neutrophilia over 80% is highly suggestive of a bacterial etiology. Also, don't forget that when people are stressed, they like to dump their neutrophils as well. So if we are worried about things, we can do some PCR testing for um, the virus that we might think could be causing this. And if we think it's croup, it's usually diagnosed by physical presentation because croup is this kind of persistent cough that's very easy to evaluate and diagnose. So here's your buzzwords. I know everybody likes the buzzwords. So here you go. Croup, steeple sign, 
laryngeomalacia. It's going to be a kid that's developing slowly or having some sort of a um, feeding problem. Tracheomalacia, we've got to do a barium swallow. Epiglottitis, thumbprint sign, steeple sign for croup. Croup is a steeple and epiglottis is a thumb, okay? Retroperitoneal abscess, you're going to have widening of the prevertebral tissues. What the heck does that mean? Well, we'll show you some of those soon. And peritonsillar abscess, a small bit of muffled voice, and they're going to have uvular deviation. And a vascular ring is noted on a barium swallow study. MRI or angiography of the chest is the definitive study for this. So here's the steeple sign with croup. So it really does look like a church's steeple, right? And here's the people, right? Well, this is the steeple sign. So that normally the airway is looking like this, right? And with the steeple sign, you see this steepling, that kind of pointed black dark part there. Well, that's just telling you that this patient has croup and they've got inflammation here of the upper airway that's choking off the air. All right, epiglottitis. So this is the thumbprint sign because it literally looks like a thumbprint. Okay, here's a normal trachea. Here's a normal um, epiglottis and here's a huge one, right? This is choking off the airway. So that's something that we want to make sure that we're capturing when we look at that. All right, the approach to cough. So a chronic cough is defined as a cough lasting longer than four to eight weeks. Approach to chronic cough. So we want to think about these things, asthma, chronic sinusitis, GERD, um, psychologic, psychogenic cough, atypical pneumonia, pertussis, mycoplasm, foreign body aspiration, chronic aspiration, cystic fibrosis. This is a big, 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 long list of differentials. So make sure that you hit your review books hard here. The approach to the chronic cough, chronic cough, following a witness choking us episode, right? We're thinking about foreign body. Habitual cough um, usually ceases when the child is asleep. So this is a really good piece of historical information to gather from the patient. Neonatal onset or regurgent cough, it may represent congenital airway. Malformation could also be a GERD type symptom. So triggers, are there exacerbations? Is it when they lay flat? Is it associated with allergies? Is there exertional component that would suggest asthma? Is it a cough after swallowing, which suggests chronic aspiration or tracheoesophageal reflux or fistula? The character of the cough, is it a whooping type cough? Do they cough until they puke? That is the classic pertussis sign. Approach to the cough with chronic historical findings, so environmental exposures. Allergens including dander, dust mites, pollen, blah, 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 right? There's something in the environment that's bothering this patient. Exposure to tuberculosis, well, that's, uh, uh, yeah, well, we might want to investigate that a little bit, but if we're talking about a foreigner, Generally, these people may be more susceptible or have been exposed to persons with tuberculosis. Usually in the States, you don't see this as much, but if there's somebody who's recently um, come to the States and you're seeing them, you need to keep that in the back of your mind. Travel, have they traveled somewhere? Do they live in the Ohio River Valley? Were they um, digging? near the river valley in Ohio? Um, do they come from uh, California, from Death Valley, or from um, the Valley of California? Then they're more likely to have these fungal pneumonias. So just something to keep in our mind about that cough. So the approach to chronic cough, historical findings, Fever suggests an infectious etiology. Classic symptoms of asthma is the wheeze. Hemoptysis is a serious sign of something going on like either tuberculosis or more likely a blood clot in the lung. Failure to thrive is a classic symptom of cystic fibrosis. And there's going to be a family history there, right? 
All right, so general parameters and growth parameters. So we want to make sure we're watching this child's airway. We want to see how they're working to breathe. Are they having any strider? Is there ronchi? Is there wheezing suggestive of asthma? Is there focal wheezing in just one location suggestive of a foreign body aspiration or tumor? What do their nasopharynx look like? Is it boggy? Are there nasal polyps? Is there any signs of cystic fibrosis? Is there clubbing? Is there the Samter's triad, right? What is Samter's triad? Well, Samter's triad is an aller, aller, aspirin allergy plus asthma plus nasal polyps. Cardiac examination needs to be done very thorough. We could also think about getting a uh, specialist to evaluate the child if we're worried about a cardiac cause, neurologic examination because hypotonia is a risk for chronic aspiration. So a child that is flaccid is going to be at risk for aspirating when they swallow food and liquid. All right, so let's consider our differential diagnoses. We can do a complete blood count. There's that neutrophil. That's a bilobe neutrophil. So that is definitely part of our left shift that neutrophil should normally have about six little septations which this one does not uh oh i totally lied i'm sorry that's why i'm supposed to be a med tech i get it this is not a neutrophil it's difficult to distinguish because the staining's a little bit off but this is actually an eosinophil so this eosinophil is involved in allergic reactions. Um, so eosinophilia is found in allergic reactions, parasitic diseases, and asthma. Eosinophils fight those and fight allergens, and that's why we see those elevated in the blood of those people. We can also do some spirometry if we're um, suspicious for asthma and we have time. If we think there's an infectious etiology and they're giving you that history of post-tussive emesis, we want to do, um, we want to start them on azithromycin, of course, and then we also want to send off PCR for pertussis. We can do PPD testing if we're worried about tuberculosis. Mycoplasma titers are also available. The sweat chloride test is the test of choice for cystic fibrosis. How do we do this? Well, we pretty much just lick their arm and see if it's salty. No. No, that's not what we do. Sweat chloride test is this um, electrode that goes on the skin, and then we measure how much sodium comes out of their body. Well, the cystic fibrosis, pa fibrosis patients aren't able to process sodium as well, so they secrete this salty, salty, salty stuff and it, it is increased. So we can also do bronchoscopy where we look down in there and directly visualize that. Approach to chronic cough. So check chest air, air, a chest x-ray is going to rarely confirm the diagnosis. We want to think about cardiac abnormalities and the big one that the boards love is this tetralogy of Fallot. This is one of those things called the boot-shaped heart. So there's that boot-shaped heart with the tetralogy of Fallot. Chest x-ray may show some bronchiectasis. That just means collapsing of lung, especially with cystic fibrosis patients as bronchiectasis is usually and can be due to low surfactant levels. Barium swallow may be done and an echocardiogram and an ECG can also be done if we're, if we're suspecting something going on with the cardiac muscle. So approach to respiratory distress. So once again, we want to assess the airway. We want to make sure that this child is closely, closely monitored. We do not have a lot of room for child's children to go south. So if we're worried about infection, we want to think about is this an upper airway infection or a lower inner airway infection? Upper airway is going to be your normal URI, coronavirus, croup, tracheitis, okay, something in the upper airway. Lower airway will be bronchiolitis, pneumonia, and um, some sort of alveolar collapse, which can be indicative of some chronic airway abnormality or what they call um, atelectasis, where the, the lungs close down on themselves. 
MUN infections may be bacterial, viral, or fungal. So keep that in mind. Generally, sputum culture will elicit our cause. Asthma is recurrent. It's bouts of bronchoconstriction and the underlying inflammation of the airways resulting in reversible airway obstruction. Most children will wheeze, but severe obstruction, a silent chest, is really freaky. If I listen to somebody, oh shoot. If I listen to somebody and they've got quiet airways, I'm really worried about that person. I just broke a cup. Sorry. Oh. No biggie. Don't worry. I'm okay, guys. All right. Oh, man. Okay. I'm going to keep going, though. I've got no time to stop here. We've got a lot to do. There's like 200 slides in this lecture. But lots of information in a short amount of time. This is a great lecture to learn. And I'm trying to bring together everything in respiratory to the pediatric population so that you touch on a little bit of everything. So tumors can be um, aggressive or can slowly progress. They may mimic asthma as they're compressing on the airway. We saw that one picture at the start with that outgrowth into the trachea that is concerning. Foreign body aspiration usually peak from two, 12 months to 24 months. Why? Because they're putting everything in their mouth. Once these children are mobile, they're most at risk. Young children with small foods like seeds, nuts, popcorn, grapes, hot dogs commonly will aspirate. They may have a witness choking episode. That's nice because then we know what's going on. They can have wheezing, wheezing, strider, hoarseness, and drooling. Consider foreign body aspiration if the breath sounds are focally abnormal. Pneumonitis, parenchymal inflammation caused by non-infection irritants like Inhaling oils, paint thinners, dusts, powders, liquids, vomiting, or near drowning can all cause inflammation of the lung tissue, also known as pneumonitis. Symptoms worsen over the first 24 to 48 hours due to surfactant washout and poor lung compliance. Diabetic or so metabolic disturbance, breath sounds will be normal in somebody with DKA. So Diabetic ketoacidosis, the patient is trying to blow off CO2. So they're doing this deep, rapid breathing. It's labored. They call this, it's directly translated as air hunger. This patient can just not get out enough CO2 fast enough. Hypoglycemia, especially in the newborn, can cause tachypnea or bradypnea. So that's really fun. They can either breathe fast or breathe slow. Okay, that tells me a lot. Inborn errors of metabolism can cause tachypnea and are associated with metabolic acidosis. Approach to the respiratory distress. We need to know when. When was the child last well? What changes or exposures have they been involved with? Or was there any sentinel event like they went swimming? They was a choking episode. They were stung by a bee, and how long has this been going on? Has it ever happened before? Do they take any medications? Is this a sick child or a not sick child? Associated symptoms, is there cough, chest pain, orthopnea, fever, drooling, change in voice, anything like that? We wanna take that very seriously. Approach to respiratory distress, well, the physical exam is gonna start with inspection, right? We're gonna calculate their rate of breathing. A normal child respiratory rate does vary with age, so look up these normals because that is something we really want to know. Is this child actually breathing quick or do just children just breathe faster than adults? Usually the normal uh, respiratory rate for a child is about 26. When the nursing staff tells me that a two or three year old child has a respiratory rate of 18, I call BS and I tell them to go back and check it because that is what we do for adults. We say hey, everybody's got a respiratory rate of 18, but when we're talking about a pediatric, that is rate of penic. So we need to think about that. That can be a problem. So make sure that those vital signs are documented appropriately. If you see work of breathing, they're gonna be heaving their chest. The supraclavicular region is going to be going up and down. Their abdominals may be working, Eventually, they may get tired and run out, and that's when we're really worried. 
Approach to respiratory stress on physical exams. We're going to palpate. We're going to percuss. We're going to check for uh, fluid doing our percussion in those lung fields. Dullness per to, to percussion or fluid overload is suggested with pneumonia, effusion, or a hemothorax. Strider, so the approach to respiratory distress with our auscultation, strider, inspiratory harsh squeaking sound indicated extrathoracic airway obstruction. Croup is a common viral cause of strider associated with a barking cough. Once you hear a croup cough, you will not forget it and signs of an infectious process. I'm telling you, you do not wonder if a kid has croup when they come in and they've got that barky cough and that strider, you just know they have croup. There is no second guessing. If you're second guessing your diagnosis, then you do not have a child with croup. Wheezing, maybe inspiratory, expiratory, or biphasic, maybe due to infection, inflammation, and or obstruction. Congestion in the airways, ronchi and rails. So what caused these physical exam findings? Well, ronchi and rails can be caused by airway congestion. These are primarily heard on inspiration. Rails directly means crackles. These are high pitched, sounds like Velcro being pulled apart. Ronchi are coarse, low pitched down in the bronchioles in the bronchial tree. Bronchophony is normal for breath sounds to be softer toward the peripheral lung tissue. Breath sounds or spoken words like 99 are louder over areas of consolidation like pneumonia or effusion. Egophony, E or A changes over areas of lung consolidation. So if you say E, 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 and you're moving your stethoscope during those lung fields, and now that E sounds like A ah or A, E turns to A, then we know we have consolidation. We want to suspect pneumonia. The approach to respiratory distress, when we do a chest x-ray, we may see low bar, low bar con, consolidation, suggestive of bacterial pneumonia. This may be due to a post-obstructive atelectasis, like a foreign body airway cyst or tumor. Diffuse infiltration suggests pneumonitis from hypersensitivity, fungal infection, viral infection, or atypical bacteria. Lack of infiltrates with hyperinflated lungs. Lungs should occupy about nine rib spaces when we count the ribs. That is a good chest film. The flattened diaphragm indicates obstructive-like process like asthma. In our lateral films, it may be helpful to exclude mediastinal masses or a pneumomediastinum. Also define extrapulmonic effusions aid with retrocardiac densities in place lesions in the anterior or posterior dimensions. So here's just some generalized chest x-ray. So there's the right lobe. That is a right middle lobe pneumonia. Here on the left, you've got these big, huge lungs, which is indicative of a female there with COPD. She's probably super tiny, and I would guess we're talking about some emphysema, so we're talking about a smoker there. Approach to respiratory distress, diagnostics, and blood gases. So hypoxemia, respiratory failure, is a definable term with a PaO2 of less than 60 millimeters of mercury, while the FiO2 is greater than 0 0.06. Hypercapnia or hyper um, carbiac, hypercarbic basically means lots of CO2. It is a PCO2 of greater than 50 millimeters of mercury. Respiratory failure is an indication for intubation and mechanical ventilation. When do we intubate? It has nothing to do with these numbers. We intubate when the patient cannot maintain their airway. That's when we intubate. Approach to respiratory distress labs, blood cultures. Blood cultures are looking for a pneumonia that has slipped into the bloodstream causing sepsis. This is very low yield in outpatient pneumonia, but we may see this in some of our hospitalized patients. About 10% of patients with an effusion will end up with sepsis. What is the most useful type of 
bacteria that we can isolate is going to probably be our aerobic pathogens, but we want to make sure that we also get an anaerobic. In our pediatric population, we only need a couple mils of blood. This has a lower volume of solute. So what's in these blood culture bottles? Well, it's a culture medium. So it's a yummy, yummy fluid that bacteria really like. And plus there is also charcoal in here. Okay. That's why they're black. What the charcoal does is it sucks up any antibiotic that might be in there with the bacterium because we don't want to kill these bacteria. This anaerobic might really be used if we think we maybe had an aspiration pneumonia. We've got somebody that was swimming or somebody that aspirated on something. We need to get an anaerobic because that aspirated material may have gone deep down in the lung, in the airway, and it could be caused by an anaerobic bacteria. So we need to isolate that. So a real blood culture is two sets from two separate sites. And both of those sets have one, an anaerobic, and two, an aerobic. And if you're talking about a pediatric patient, you can just do one from one site. However, it is always best to do two because a lot of times these will come back contaminated where the skin contaminated, the skin of the patient was not cleansed properly or the person palpated for the vein after cleansing the skin causing contamination with bacteria. So if we see some bacteria like staph, staph epidermidis, we need to be concerned and skeptical that this is most likely a fake blood culture, meaning that it is just a contaminant. One blood culture that's positive doesn't usually indicate a full-blown infection, but if you got two positive cultures back-to-back, -back, then we're really suspicious for sepsis, plus there's going to be other criteria. Approach to labs here, we've got white blood cell count, usually greater than 15,000 is going to make us think that we're dealing with some sort of a pathogen. If this is an elevated neutrophil count, then we're probably dealing with bacteria. And if it's an elevated lymphocyte count, then we're probably dealing with a virus. Elevated CRP or SED rate, these are sensitive, but they're just not super specific. So CRP is going to be elevated in any acute um, inflam inflammatory response, whereas the SED rate is more of a chronic inflammation. However, these are not always a hard line. Procalcitonin, I really like that one. So a procalcitonin greater than 0 0.05 indicates that the body is trying to fight a bacterial infection. Now, it's not always the initial procal, it's the change in procalcitonin. So if we get a procalcitonin on a patient, we're going to admit our hospital gives us the high five because we're so darn smart. And then two days later, we recheck that procalcitonin and the procalcitonin has skyrocketed. We know that we are losing the fight to this bacterium. If the procalcitonin has stayed the same or is slightly decreasing, then we are winning. <clears throat> Approach to airway distress. So first we wanna tip the head and lift the airway. This maneuver is called the head tilt chin lift. We wanna make sure that there's nothing to obstruct our flow and we do not wanna do blind finger sweeps in kids. Breathing, we wanna assess <clears throat> adequate breathing. Are they blowing off CO2? Are they oxygenated? We wanna titrate the oxygen to decrease distress so that their SpO2 is greater than 90%. So we should see on that oxygen sat monitor, greater than 90%. Medications that we can use, albuterol, oral prednisone. Oral prednisone in the pill form is just as effective as prednisone through the IV, so don't forget that. If you can get this down their throat, you will greatly increase their chances of living. Dexamethasone, 0.6 mg per kg is given for croup, one intravenous or intramuscular dose for croup. Racemic epinephrine is also given for croup. If, if I'm in the emergency room, I almost always give both Antibiotics if bacterial illness is likely and IV fluids if oral intake is poor or the child is dehydrated. Respiratory distress of the newborn. 
Respiratory distress of the newborn is a transient tachypnea of the newborn. It is benign parenchymal lung disorder of immediate newborn period. Most common cause of neonatal distress. The pathophysiology is failure of fetal alveolar fluid clearance leads to poor compliance and tachypnea. The risk factors include cesarean section, male babies, and maternal diabetes. My little boy had twins. One of the twins was a female. One of them was a male. My male's first APGAR score was a seven, and the female's APGAR score was nine. The only reason he was a seven is because they had to suction him, and then at five minutes, he was a nine as well. Clinical features include respiratory distress, tachypnea, grunting, hypoxia, work of breathing. Symptoms may begin at birth and last up to 24 hours. All right, respiratory distress in the newborn patient is usually transient tachypnea of the newborn. This is the most common. It is a clinical diagnosis or a diagnosis of exclusion. We want to distinguish this between sepsis, pneumonia, pneumothorax, structural abnormalities, anatomic causes, respiratory distress syndrome. Other potential differentials could include cardiac abnormality, metabolic disorders, hypoxic brain injuries. The chest x-ray may show interstitial edema, possible cardiomegaly, and a pleural effusion. These studies should be repeated, and the study may show rapid improvement upon repeat. Treatment is supportive. We want to administer oxygen or CPAP may be required to push some of that fluid back out. Here's this transient tachypnea. So basically there's some fluid in the lungs, there's interstitial edema, we can see that, this kind of white out here, it's very patchy. And then later we see here that now this patient would have cleared, but this is also showing us in a cardiac enlargement, so we could be concerned about some tetralogy of Fallot, or some other cardiomegaly problem with this child. Transient tachypnea generally is going to wear off within the first 24 hours. It is definitely going to last for only hours and may last days, but that is very rare. All right, aspiration syndromes can also happen with respiratory distress of the newborn typically occur in full-term infants or late preterm infants. You might, they may aspirate blood or meconium in the amniotic fluid. They can be stressed and an infant will gasp in utero causing them to aspirate meconium into their lung tissue. This is a bad thing because meconium is nasty poop basically and they just sucked it into their lungs. This can cause a bad, bad problem. They may have a barrel chest appearance and coarse breath sounds. You want to get your specialist involved right away. Respiratory distress of the newborn. These aspiration syndromes can be caused by pneumonitis with increased O2 need may require intubation and or mechanical ventilation. The chest x-ray is going to show coarse asymmetric infiltrates, hyperexpansion, and lobar consolidations. If these are occurring, this is our worst case scenario. This is, puts this child at increased risk of pneumothorax, primary pulmonary hypertension as well. Respiratory distress syndrome in the newborn, congenital pneumonia. So congenital pneumonia is most common site of infection for neonates. The, the lung is the most common site of infection for this particular abnormality. Usually ascend from genital tract before or during labor. Most likely culprits here are going to be vaginal or rectal flora. Beta strep group B, this is why we vaccinate mothers or test them for beta strep group B or E. coli. Respiratory distress may be present at birth or a few hours or days after delivery. We want to do a chest x-ray. This may resemble retained lung fluid or highline membrane disease. Rarely, we're going to see a lobal infiltrate or a pleural effusion. Congenital pneumonia may be complicated by acquired surfactant deficiency or systemic sepsis. Who's going to have surfactant deficiency? Ding, 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 it's going to be your cystic fibrosis patients. 
So what are we gonna do with these patients with congenital pneumonia? Well, we're gonna support them. We're gonna make sure that they don't go into shock and they don't have poor perfusion. We're gonna get an absolute neutrophil count. We wanna make sure that this is less than 2000. If it's greater than that, or it's severely decreased, like an absolute neutropilia, neutropenia is considered less than 2000 neutrophils per mil, then we're concerned that they're actually losing this fight. They're probably going to have an elevated CRP and they're definitely going to have an elevated procalcitonin. Procalcitonin is indicative of what type of infection. A bacterial infection. Procalcitonin indicates a bacterial infection. Gram staining of tracheal aspirates may be helpful to know what kind of bacterium we're dealing with, whether it's a gram positive or gram negative. That will guide our selection of antimicrobials in the form of antibiotics. Basically, all these labs can be useless, but we still need to do them. We're going to draw blood cultures, and we're empirically going to put these kids on ampicillin and gentamicin. Spontaneous pneumothorax occurs in about 1% of deliveries, so this is not very high yield. Increased risk with intervention, interventions such as PEEP in the delivery room so we can blow out these lungs. Respiratory distress may be present with tachypnea. The breath sounds may de be decreased on the affected side. Chest x-ray is going to show a normal thorax. Duh. There's a pneumothorax. You can see that there is no lung parenchyma from here on. This is all dropping down. So you've got a pneumothorax there that obviously is not a child, but it's difficult to find child ones. And if I found one, you guys wouldn't see it anyways. All right, respiratory distress in the newborn, spontaneous pneumothorax. Provides supplemental oxygen. This is how we treat them. We can do a needle thoracentesis. I bet you guys would just love to do this. We're gonna go under that second intercoastal space. We're gonna put a big 18 gauge needle in there and we're gonna hear a as that lung reinflates. But you probably will never get to do one of these. I haven't and I have a heck of a lot more opportunity than you guys would. But I hope you get to do it. Maybe one of you crazies will do it. I bet um, somebody will end up doing it. And if you do, you better email me. All right. So let's also look here, associated with spontaneous pneumosaur, so slight, slight risk of um, renal abnormalities. We need to do a careful physical exam of the kidneys, evaluate their urine output, and if pulmonary hypoplasia is present, then we can suspect that there might be a problem with the kidneys and we need to check on their kidneys. Surfactant deficiency, so surfactant deficiency causes, so the lungs start making surfactant at about 24 weeks, so any child that's born around this time is potentially going to have low surfactant. If there is adequate amounts at about 35 weeks, then they're pretty much good to go after that. Lack of pulmonary surfactant resulting in mild to severe pulmonary compromise during the neonatal period. That surfactant keeps those alveoli open, so it's difficult when they collapse to get them open again. Caused by deficient, deficient surfactant production from several mechanisms. Lack of surfactant increases the surface tension and it causes atelectasis, where those lung cells stick together. They can be exacerbated by a chest wall compliance, in compliance in a newborn patient. Atelectic lungs is well perfused but not ventilated, causing hypoxemia, decreased lung compliance, increased work of breathing, and physiologic dead space combined with poor alveolar ventilation lead to hypercapnia, which means they've got a lot of CO2 in their blood. So this is something you guys can watch, pulmonary surfactant. I would encourage you to watch that. Surfactant deficiency, so risks include prematurity, maternal diabetes, cesarean delivery, asphyxia, cold stress, previously affected sibling. Historical findings include a history of prematurity, 
intrapartum history, meconium, poor APGAR scales. Uh, associated with inflammatory conditions that may be maternal or neonatal. Physical examination includes the rapid exam right when they're born and then one five minutes after that. Breath sounds may be normal or decrease or they may have a harsh tubular quality with fine crackles. Surfactant deficiency differential diagnoses are here. They can have transient tachypnea of the newborn, neonatal, pro neonatal pneumonia, sepsis, pulmonary hypoplasia, meconium aspiration, congenital heart disease, and congenital lung abnormalities. This is a ventilation perfusion scan and a lectin sphygmomyelin ratio, which plots the sphygmomyelin and the lectin you see a less than two to one ratio likely results from a surfactant deficiency. This is performed on the maternal amniotic fluid and estimates the degree of surfactant production. Ground glass appearance may be seen on x-ray in the bilateral lung fields, retain fluid in the lung fissures or air bronchograms, hypoexpansion with areas of atelectasis. Surfactant deficiency the therapy is CPAP or mechanical ventilation, and we can also give them some synthetic surfactants. Complications result from barotrauma or lack of surfactant. Supportive care may be may include pneumothorax, may result in a pneumothorax. Prognosis is variable. Prenatal corticosteroids are the best for women that we think may be getting ready to give birth to a premature infant. That's going to increase their, um, rapidly increase their production of surfactant. Here is a video on highline membrane disease. It does a much better job at explaining highline membrane disease than I do. This is in the pants blueprint, so it's something that you will be tested on and you need to know. I am using this video as a conjunct to this lecture material. This is a long lecture anyways, so I wanted to give you this for a augmentation of highline memory of disease. Croup syndrome, so aka also known as laryngeotracheobronchiolitis, generally affects children ages six months to five years. Right around flu time, this is also called parainfluenza. These parainfluenza viruses are usually the culprits, may also be caused by um, like a pneumonia type pathogen and I'm trying to think, mycoplasma, oh my gosh, that just escaped me, I might be getting a little tired here, and have supraglottic edema, prominent manifestation of this upper airway obstruction, there's inflammation over the entire airway is often present. They're going to have a barking, striderous cough. They're going to have strider. They're going to be febrile. They're going to be sick. They might be um, wheezing or strider, but they're not going to be drooling like you do with epiglottis, epiglottitis. And they're going to have a steeple sign. So you get a sick kid with strider who's not drooling and has a steeple sign. Well, your answer is going to be croup. It is caused by parainfluenza. How do we grade these? How do we talk to our specialists? Well, we can give these children a Wesley score. So the Wesley score is designed uh, to assess a croup patient and to have a uh, nice way to unify where these patients are. So you score your patient. If they have strider with agitation, they have less of a number, if they have strider at rest, then there are two. Anyway, so children with moderate croup have a Wesley score of two to seven. Children with severe croup have a Wesley score above eight. Treatment for croup is steroids, but it's going to be steroids and racemic epi, okay? Corticosteroids are your mainstay here for croup treatment. Dexamethasone is usually the steroid of choice. This decreases symptoms, hospitalization, and 
intubation. So we wanna get these on board as quickly as possible. It is okay to discharge them home after watching them for three to four hours and making sure that they responded well to the glucocorticoids and the nebulized epinephrine. If not, we've gotta keep them. If the patient becomes innovated, they're gonna be on the vent for two to three days and this can be a much more difficult patient to get out of the hospital. Croup. There it is, there's your croup, okay? Parainfluenza, barking seal cough, subglottic narrowing. I'm gonna give them humidified oxygen, steroids, and racemic epinephrine. Epiglottitis, epiglottitis is caused by Haemophilus influenza sometimes, can also be caused by Neisseria meningitidis and strep pneuma. Classic presentation is a sudden onset of high fever, Sick, 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 drooling, muffled voice. These kids are sick as stink. They could be cyanotic. They might have a strider, but that's not the hallmark. They're going to be tripoding in the sniffing dog position. They're going to progress to total airway obstruction if we do not treat this. Direct inspection of the epiglottis only under controlled conditions with a experienced provider. We're also going to see a cherry red spot and swollen epiglottis or a swollen adenoids if we actually see in there. More likely we're going to do a lateral neck film and we have to ask for a lateral neck film because they will not, if you just order a neck film, you need to specify that you want it lateral because you're looking for croup. You're looking for the thumbprint sign. You want to see that big fat swollen epiglottis. Endotracheal intubation, if we absolutely have to. If we do, these kids are sick as stink. We're gonna get blood cultures. We're gonna start them on ceftriaxone or an equivalent cephalosporin immediately. They're gonna get extubated in about 24 to 48 hours. Intravenous antibiotics for two to three days, and then we can switch them over to oral antibiotics. So here's the epiglottis. It's super inflamed. There's that thumbprint sign. Etiologies are Haemophilus influenza, Streptococcus, Staph, and MOCA. Bacterial tracheitis, so AKA pseudomembranous croup. This is a severe life-threatening form of laryngeotracheobronchitis. So this is basically croup gone insane, all right? So it's a severe upper airway obstruction with fever. So these kids are stick as stink. This kid is not going home can be caused by Staph aureus or other group alpha, beta, hemolytic streps. Can also be caused by Haemophilus influenza, Neisseria species, or MOCA. So are you getting the trend that these bacterium tend to repeat themselves? Disease likely represents local mucosal invasion of bacteria in the patient and was started by croup, and then now you've got this secondary infection. Results from the edema, purulent secretions, and pseudomembrane. Tracheal suction and cultures. We need blood work and cultures. We need to check for viral croup. We need to um, treat the high fever. We need to start this patient on antibiotics, and we need to treat for toxic shock and acute respiratory distress syndrome. All right, what else are we gonna see? Well, we're gonna see a left shift, which we already talked about. We're gonna see some tracheal structures because we need to get down there and get a culture. We're going to see on the lateral film that there is a normal epiglottic region and there may be severe subglottic um, narrowing or tracheal narrowing, that severe steeple sign irregularity of the contour of the proximal tracheal mucosa and they're gonna be sick as stink. This requires direct bronchoscopy to diagnose. So this kid is going in a bird, once we stabilize them to a hospital where this can be done. Management, we wanna visualize it. Usually when we innovate these patients, we're gonna give them humidified air, we're gonna do frequent suctioning, we're gonna do intravenous broad spectrum antibiotics to cover all those bugs we talked about. Prolonged intubation can be compared to epiglottitis or croup. 
relatively low mortality rate if recognized and treated properly. So there's bacterial trachelitis. You get this pseudomembrane like was kind of seen with diphtheria, but this is down in the trachea. And they're gonna have mucoperlant secretions, fever, barky cough. Just think of this as like uh, croup on steroids. Oh, actually croup off steroids, because if croup was on steroids, it wouldn't be so bad. Um, let's see, what else? Okay, here's a little table that I think you might find helpful. You should memorize or at least kind of have a good idea of this table. It gives you some age ranges, kind of the prodrome, the most common causes, the x-ray findings, and the clinical appearance, as well as if they can get a vaccination for suspected pathogens and how to manage it. So that's a really super helpful table. If you know that, you know a lot. Foreign body aspiration or airway obstruction, significant cause of accidental death each year. Lower airway obstruction, coughing, um, and they may or may not be in respiratory distress. High risk in the six months to four year olds. Homes and daycare centers. No treatment, just if, if this is not treated and the foreign body is not removed, the patient can develop progressive cyanosis, loss of consciousness, seizures, bradycardiac, and they're going to die. Key type of treatment is the ability to localize the foreign body and extract it. Generally, uh, if the foreign body is down in the right bronchus, they're going to do rigid bronchoscopy is always the answer for this um, diagnosis, that's always the treatment answer in the book. There's the foreign body, it's in the right menstein bronchus, and we are going to go get it with a rigid bronchoscope. High index of suspicion, x-ray is not always enough if we're really concerned or we have a really good story for something in there. There can be a history of aspiration when kids we're going to do these x-rays where we basically x-ray them from the throat to the stomach. No chest, uh, no chest postural drainage anymore. They used to do that. Uh, they used to try to change their position and drain it out, but they don't do that now. They do the rigid bronchoscopy because you can obstruct major central airway. Bronchoscop bronchoscopic removal. Um, is going to happen with the rigid bronchoscopy um, complications. They can have the airway can collapse and they can end up with a lung abscess if that goes down in the airway and is never taken out. So here's a coin. If it's lodged in the trachea, it looks like it's on its side, but if it's stuck in the esophagus, it's going to look straight. If it's straight, then that means they'll probably pass it without a problem. But if it's sideways in the trachea, then we're in deep doo-doo and we gotta go digging for it. Bronchiectasis. So bronchiectasis is primarily caused by cystic fibrosis. Pseudomonas is the most common pathogen in these cystic fibrotic patients. Um, also can cause uh, lung infection, can be caused by lung infections like pneumonia, lung abscess, TB, fungal, or viral infections. Um, these people are more prone to bronchiectasis if they have AIDS or they're going through chemotherapy. There may be a localized airway obstruction that causes the bronchiectasis. Inflammation can cause this like pneumonitis, glomerul granulomatous lung disease, and allergic aspergillosis. Bronchiectasis uh, manifestations include bad breath, crackles at the lung bases, cough with expectorant, foul smelling sputum, night fevers, night sweats, generalized malaise. Homoptysis is a common cause um, and it may result in massive homoptysis. They may have some clubbing and they may have some skin pallor if this is chronic. So, high resolution CT scan is going to show us these. T tram, tram track appearance or a signet sign, which just shows these coupled dilated bronchus. 
bronchial wall thickening. On chest x-ray, we may see some hyperinflation. We can have some crowded lung markings like peribronchial fibrosis, small cystic spaces at the lungs and the bases of the lungs. Obstructive pattern will be seen if you do pulmonary function testing like decrease FEV1 and decrease FVC as well as decrease FEV1 to FEVC ratio is less than 70. There's sputum, we wanna culture that. They may um, grow out something like Pseudomonas, Moraxella cateralis, or an Aspergillosis, which we need to know that if we're looking for a fungal infection that's a different culture, we need to specifically ask for a fungal culture or they will not set those plates up. There's bronchiectasis, which you can think of as these big rings in the lung tissue where there's no functional lung tissue. Management, antibiotics. So we want to treat whatever the pathogen is. So we may need some sputum cultures, uh, fluoroquinolones, piptazo, aminoglycosides, or cephalosporin. If it's aspergillosis, asper, aspergillosis, whatever. If it's Aspergillus, then we want to give them corticosteroids and itraconazole. Mucus management can be performed with N acetylcysteine, bronchodilators, NSAID surgery, embolization of spots of bleeding, and a chest physiotherapy. That's where you pound on their back. You want to make sure that these patients are adequately hydrated give them such supplemental oxygen if necessary and surgery to resect or transplant in severe cases. So here's bronchiectasis, irreversible dilation and destruction of the bronchi, bronchi, inadequate clearance of mucus in the airways and cycles of infection and inflammation. So this is primarily seen in our cystic fibrosis patients or patients with recurrent pneumonia, aspiration or tumor. We're going to hear crackles and purulent. We're going to hear crackles, wheezes, and they'll probably have some purulent sputum. Cystic fibrosis, autosomal recessive disorder, abnormal chloride transportation. That's why we do the sweat chloride test. Really hits the lungs and the pancreas. So that's always a good test question. They're going to have GI symptoms and lung problems in cystic fibrosis. Lucky guys. Thick airway secretions, they can have infection, they have altered inflammatory response, so they don't respond very well to pathogens. The chronic inflammation is going to destroy the medium and small airways, and then they end up with these bronchiectic changes on the chest x-ray and CT scans. The chronic pathogens that can colonize these persons are Staph aureus, Increasingly more now, we're getting methicillin resistant Staph aureus. Haemophilus influ influenza is a cause. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a cause. Burkholderia susceptia is a cause. Requires strict isolation for CF patients. Spontaneous pneumothorax can occur. This can be recurrent, but it is rare. And this is caused from small airway plugging, causing the pneumonia, the, 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 causing the lung to collapse. Pulmonary hemorrhage can be due to inflammation and airway erosion. All right, so cystic fibrosis, the initial manifestations could be a meconium ileus in infants because of the chloride abnormalities. They can be asymptomatic, but abnormal newborn screening is going to happen. It can be recurrent, persistent respiratory infections. It sounds super miserable. Symptoms of pancreatic insufficiency, such as steatorrhea and generalized edema. They can have failure to thrive, and there's always going to be a family history because it's autosomal recessive. Physical manifestations include coarse crackles, decreased air entry, tachypnea, respiratory muscles, using accessory respiratory muscles. They might have a barrel chest appearance. They're gonna have some digital clubbing, hypoxia, exercise intolerance, weight loss, 
and decreased pulmonary function on spirometry. There's going to be a family history. This could result in metabolic acidosis due to dehydration from chloride loss in the sweat. They're not going to be able to produce fat soluble vitamins. So they'll have a vitamin deficiency and there's fat soluble vitamins. There may be clubbing of the digits and they're gonna have recurrent pulmonary infections with pneumo pneumonia, <laughs> with pseudomonas pneumonia. They are also more prone to chronic cough, recurrent pneumonia, recurrent sinusitis, unexplained poor weight gain, unexplained failure to thrive, nasal polyps, and rectal prolapse. The chloride sweat test is the primary test of choice. If the results are greater than 60 millimoles per liter on two occasions, that's a positive test. Then we should also do DNA testing, a chest x-ray, PFT testing, and sputum cultures. <laughs> Management is going to be with Saba and Laba, as well as N-acetylcysteine. Antibiotics are bug specific, so we need to get a culture, and they can also be on decongestants. Encouragement of regular exercise and proper nutrition. Pancreatic enzymes can be replaced and help to aid absorption of fat soluble vitamins and fat soluble vitamins should be supplemented. Lung and pancreatic transplant is the ultimate fix. Vaccinations for influenza and pneumococcal pneumonia because these are high risk population. Here is a little cystic fibrosis um, cheat sheet. So muconium ileus, pseudomonas aeruginosa, and pancreatic insufficiency. Sweat chloride testing is the mainstay of identification. Bronchiolitis, so this is um, inflammation of the bronchioles. There's acute bronchiolitis, bronchiolitis obliterans, which is constrictive and cryptogenic organized pneumonia. So lower respiratory infection of the small airways, proliferation and necrosis of bronchial epithelium cause peripheral airway narrowing and variable obstruction. RSV is the most common cause. Bronchiolitis, RSV, usually affects infants below the age of two, complicated by secondary infection with strep pneumo and associated otitis media. Symptoms include fever, URI, and respiratory distress. Your pulse ox is the best predictor of disease in children as that's going to be decreased. Management, humidified oxygen is the mainstay of therapy. Basically, there is nothing you can do except let this run its course. You can also give them uh, rebavirin if they are immunocompromised. No corticosteroids unless history of restrictive airway disease. Prevention with uh, this monoclonal antibody prophylaxis may be used in high-risk groups. Meticulous hand watching is the key. Bronchiolitis obliterans is just a chronic bronchial, bronchiolar inflammation and fibrosis that leads to collapse and obliteration of the bronchioles. CT scan shows this mosaic pattern, most common post-lung transplant rejection also known as silo fillers disease or coal dust, lung, high dose corticosteroids and immunosuppression, as well as a definitive treatment with lung transplant. Previously known as bronchiolitis obliterans with organizing pneumonia, this is cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, persistent alveolar exudates lead to inflammation and fibrotic scarring of the bronchioles yeah, and the alveoli mimics pneumonia on chest x-ray, but not respond to antibiotics. Chest x-ray findings persist despite the revolution, resolution of the patient's symptoms. May be idiopathic or occur post pneumonia. Management is with corticosteroids. Doesn't look fun, does it? Community acquired bacterial pneumonia. All right. Cap, community acquired bacterial pneumonia. Community acquired pneumonia. Lower respiratory tract infections are a major cause of childhood mortality in disadvantaged areas in the world. Etiologic events may vary by region. Most pneumonias in the U.S. are viral in nature, with bacterial pneumonias less frequent. 
most common bugs for all ages, streptococcus, streptococcus pneumoniae. I think I would learn that variation in condition dependent to specific pathogen and the patient that you're treating. Here are the common causes of pneumonia. This is a good table to get down. Community acquired pneumonia, so the hallmarks are fever, cough, and tachypnea. Other infections, extrapulmonary findings include meningitis or abdominal pain. Chest exam may reveal crackles, particularly in one specific site, especially if we're dealing with a bacterial pneumonia. Other sites of infection include the meninges, otitis media, sinusitis, pericarditis, epiglottitis, or an abscess. So how do we diagnose this? Well, they're gonna have an elevated white blood cell count. They may have a left shift. They may have a low white blood cell shift, or a low white blood cell count. That is a very ominous finding, meaning that they are losing the battle. So generally they're gonna be somewhere between five and 15,000, maybe even higher, but if they're below 5,000, then the white blood cells are getting taken out by the pneumonia itself. We need to get some blood cultures, particularly in our pediatric patients and sputum cultures. You can do a bronchoscopy to go down there and get the junk so that you can culture it. And we can do viral PCR or a viral panel. Community acquired pneumonia, so we can do some chest x-rays, airspace diseases, or lumbar consolidation will be suggestive of a pneumonia, interstitial, or peribronchial infiltrates suggest a viral cause. Clinical improvement precedes radiographic resolution, pleural effusion, x-rays in the lateral decubitus position are going to allow fluid to pool down here. And that's why we do the left lateral decubitus position. Non-infectious pneumonias, Community-acquired pneumonia is a differential diagnosis, includes non-infectious plus pleural effusion. Non-infectious includes gastric or foreign body aspiration, atelectasis, congenital malformations, congestive heart failure, malignancy tumors, chronic interstitial lung disease, or pulmonary hemosiderosis. Pleural effusion present may suggest a collagen disease, neoplasm, or pulmonary infarction. Community-acquired management, so if they've got pneumonia and we've uh, already diagnosed it, if they're less than four weeks, we're going to put them on an ampicillin and aminoglycoside. If they're between 12, 4 and 12 weeks, we're going to put them on ampicillin. If they're three months and uh, up to five years, we can put them on amoxicillin. A macrolide should be considered if it's an atypical, like mycoplasma pneumoniae. And... Try the antibiotic guide is helpful on this um, app. It's called EMRES. That is a really helpful app um, that gives you an antibiotic guide and particular antibiotics for certain pathogens. So let's keep going here. Admit children under three months with suspected community acquired pneumonia. Older children should be admitted if they're um, very young, they have a very severe illness, there is a um, suspected organism that we know, or it's a particularly rare organism. Um, we want to um, treat them at home if they are stable and can be treated at home. Indications for immediate admission include severe hypoxia, less than 88% on room air or when they are ambulating distress, apnea, hypoxemia, poor feeding, or deterioration clinically. Complications can be large effusions, empyema, which is a infectious process with fluid in the lung. Careful outpatient follow-up within 12 hours to five days for those who are not admitted. Community acquired pneumonia, Interventions and management is going to be oxygen supplementation, humidification of inspired glasses. We want to do a hydration and electrolyte uh, replacement. Do 
nutritional supplementation and removal of pleural field may help guidance in antimicrobial therapy. Removing it decreases compression and allows them to have better recoil. Viral pneumonia, so by far your most common, most common cause in children is parainfluenza and influenza is the most common cause in adults. Children also can experience RSV. We can have adenoviruses or coronaviruses, measles virus, varicella virus, or cytomegalovirus, which is common in AIDS patients and or immunosuppressed patients like transplant patients. How do we differentiate this? Well, manifestation. So influenza is going to present with fever, uncontrolled, uncomfortable or a lethargic patient, prominent cough, rarely hemoptysis, flushed skin, and erythematous mucous membranes. You may hear ronchi or rails. They're gonna look like they got hit by a truck because they feel like they did. Adenovirus may have some hoarseness, some pharyngitis, tachypnea, and cervical adenitis. Very difficult to really distinguish between these viruses, but we're gonna try. Measles virus, they're gonna have Coryza, conjunctivitis, rhinorrhea, and coplic spots. That is the hallmark of that exanthem. They may have pneumonitis if they're a teenager or a young adult, fever and cough. Varicilla is going to cause fever, mucopapular or vesicular rash. Sometimes these can become encrusted like um, chicken pox type pox marks. Pneumonia typically one to six days after the rash disappears. Pneumonia with cough and occasional hemoptysis. Few oscillatory abnormalities are noted on lung exam with varicella. So here's measles. These are coplic spots. There's these little gray pseudomembranous. Um, don't get these confused with aphthous ulcer because you've got the coplic spots. You've got the red eyes and you've got this rash. So if you have that triad, you have the measles. Um, so the three C's of measles, coryza, cough, conjunctivitis, viral pneumonia here. Viral pneumonia, common, co common culprits are cytomegalovirus, is particularly for immunocompromised patients, can cause fever, proximal cough, Occasional hemoptysis and diffuse adenopathy. If pneumonia occurs, um, then we want to make sure that we're treating this appropriately. How do we diagnose these? Well, we can do a sputum gram stain. If any, there may show a few polymorphal nuclear cells, which are um, your neutrophils, and there's probably going to be leukocytes. White blood cells may vary from leukopenia to modest leukocytosis, usually without a left shift, because we're going to see our left shift in a bacterial infection in general. In general, these are not absolutes. Other labs are focused on identifying the specific pathogen or family. The chest x-ray may show some localized um, it's actually going to be less localized than a uh, low bar pneumonia. It's going to be this patchy generalized interstitial infiltrates. There may be um, kind of spread throughout the entire chest x-ray. You can see some small calcified nodules with resi residual varicella pneumonia. Here's a viral infection. See, there's just this kind of vagology of this interstitial kind of schmutz. And then on the right there, you've got a middle lobe pneumonia. Pretty obvious there. So viral pneumonia management. Well, prevention is the key. Meticulous hand washing, covering mouth, cough. Oh yes, we should all mask up forever, probably six months or more, so that we make sure that we don't pass it around. Modified best uh, with rest, maintain adequate hydration. Uh, specific drugs for specific bugs includes influenza and the, the um, drug for influenza is gonna be amatidine. And if it's varicella, then it's IV acyclovir. Supportive measures include supplemental oxygen, hypoxemia. We wanna give them supplemental oxygen if they have hypoxemia. 
You can give them some antipyretics like Tylenol and ibuprofen, bronchodilators, and or expectorants. So largely supportive. RSV. RSV is a causative agent of pneumonia and acute bronchiolitis. It is a member of the paramyox virus, paramyox virus family. Symptoms associated with RSV include fever, tachypnea, prolonged expiration, wheezes, and rails. Isolation techniques are important in limiting the spread of RSV infections. Minoglobulins with high RSV neutralizing antibody titer are beneficial in treatment. Rebavirin aerosol is effective for severe RSV pneumonia. RSV causes bronchial plugging. That's where the shortness of breath comes with this. Mycoplasma pneumoniae. So mycoplasma pneumoniae is commonly seen in children over five years of age. There is a long incubation period of two to three weeks with a slow onset of symptoms. Commonly presents with fever, cough, headache, and malaise. Cough is usually dry, initially becomes more productive later in course. There may be some extra thoracic manifestations such as sore throat, otitis media, otitis externa, bowling, myringitis. Mycoplasma is also known as walking pneumonia. Mycoplasma, so rails on chest are frequently present. Decreased breath sounds or dullness to percussion. White blood cell and differential are usually normal. We can do enzyme immunoassays and complement fixation are sensitive and specific for mycoplasma pneumoniae. Diagnostic via polymerase chain reaction is also available. Chest x-ray may show interstitial or bronchopulmonic infiltrates, especially in the middle and lower lobes. The fusions are very uncommon. Mycoplasma pneumoniae can be elicited with direct Coombs positive autoimmune hemolytic anemia. This can be a life threatening disorder. Most common hematologic abnormality in the mycoplasma infection family, coagulation defects, and thrombocytopenia. Nasty little bug. CNS, we can get cerebral infarction, meningioencephalitis, Guillain Barre syndrome. CNS involvement and eventually psychosis. Dermatologic manifestations include erythema, erythema multiforme, Steven Johnson syndrome, and cardiovascular abnormalities include myocarditis, pericarditis, rheumatic fever like illnesses. So, this is not a, you, it's not a, um, a simple bug, it does cause a lot of problems. How do we treat this? Well, we wanna give these patients a macrolide for seven to 10 days. Ciprofloxacin is an alternative. We wanna support them with hydration, antipyrotics, and bed rest. Aspiration pneumonia, basically somebody aspirates into their lungs, the epiglottis doesn't catch it before it goes down into the lung tissue. Passage of foreign substances into the lower airways causing inflammation, obstruction to airflow and abnormal gas exchange. Causes, abnormal muscle tone or swallowing can cause this. So your um, patients with uh, cerebral palsy are at risk. Altered mental status due to intoxication. So your alcoholics or drug addicts and exposure to generalized anesthesia without a protected airway. Also, GERD and vomiting are other causes. Symptoms present within one to two hours after insult. Foreign body aspiration is going to result in abrupt choking symptom, symptoms. Some key history here is what kind of event was witnessed? Did you see the child eat something? When was it aspirated? <clears throat> was there a fever? It indicates that it had been there for quite some time. And are there any mental status changes? Respiratory distress may be present with aspiration pneumonia. There's also going to be a cough, especially if productive or purulent sputum or blood. Evidence of lower airway involvement include tachypnea, fever, pneumonitis, wheezing or crackles, hypoxia or cyanosis. So here is a aspiration pneumonia. You can see that both of the bases are affected by this um, infectious process labs are generally not helpful 
in distinguishing this, we need a chest x-ray to look for infectious process. Aspiration pneumonia, well, we want to support our ABCs. We can do CPAP or intubation if necessary. We want to keep their supplemental oxygen so that their SpO2 stays above 90. Whew, this is a long lecture with lots of information. Okay, apparent life-threatening events. Apparently, there has been a life-threatening event. This guy is freaking out. Okay, what is an apparent life-threatening event? Well, this occurs in children. The event is when the infant has an episode that is frightening to the observer. These can include apnea, uh, color change, changes in muscle tone, choking, gagging, or breath holding. Apparent life-threatening events here include all of these causes. An apparent life-threatening event is not a diagnosis, but a collective of symptoms. Approximately 50% of apparent life-threatening event cases are idiopathic, meaning that we don't identify a cause. Most common identifiable causes include GI, neurologic, or respiratory problems. Premature infants are more at risk here. Less than age one is definitely a risk factor and a viral upper respiratory symptom or infection is also a risk factor. Apparent life-threatening events is we need to find out what was going on before. Was the child awake, asleep, or crying? Is the relationship to the last meal, the child's location, were they in their crib, in their car seat, or were they being held? And is the caretaker, who was the caretaker, and is it the caretaker that's giving us the history? Description of the event includes the duration. Was there any central cyanosis, eye rolling, choking, or gagging, loss of consciousness, vomiting, respiratory effort, change, or muscle tone abnormalities? Interventions can be required, but are not if they're self-resolving. Self with gentle stimulation, CPR at the very worst case. If they're incurrent with illness, lethargy, or URI, it is a little bit more worrisome. Um, do they have a history of GERD? Was there an accidental or inflicted trauma? And is there a family history of sudden death or arrhythmia? Apparent life-threatening events, we need to do a good fundoscopal exam. If we see retinal hemorrhages, this is associated with non-accidental trauma, meaning somebody beat this kid up, right? Vital signs, we want to document all of this. We want to document their general appearance. We want to do a good respiratory exam, cardiac exam, and abdominal exam. Neurologically, we want to state their tone, reflexes, and their mental status. Is there any evidence of trauma, bruises, or hemotympanum? So, um, that would be blood in the tympanic membrane, and then retinal hemorrhages are always a good thing to look up. Apparent life-threatening event, we need to do some routine lab work and radiology. In 6% of cases, this will give us an answer. Many, admit, many of these patients will be admitted for a 24-hour period to pursue a further workup in history. High clinical suspicion around non-accidental trauma. We really want to work these patients up and we can do a CT of the head to look for any bleeding in the brain. Shake a baby syndrome. So this is caused by the hyperreflection and the brain smacking back and forth in the skull. This causes permanent, can cause permanent brain injury as it recoils in the skull, um, causes the brain to be bruised. There can also be axonal shear injuries and even axonal death from the shearing force. Bad, bad juju. So here's some tests and then the potential diagnoses that we need to do to make sure that these kids are safe. Child abuse, gastro, I mean, this is a huge List hospitalization for patients with unexplained. If we cannot explain this, we have to hospitalize this patient for 24 hours because there is a high mortality rate if we don't have an explanation. All right, so apparent life threatening events as a herald for significant underlying diagnosis. So we don't want to blow these parents off. These are usually those hypochondriac parents, but we don't want to blow them off. 
Not a predictor of sudden infant death syndrome, though. Sudden infant death syndrome. So sudden infant death syndrome, here's the definition, less than one year of age. Um, we need a good history, um, aka sudden unexplained infant death syndrome. Epidemiology is between age one to 12 months with the median age being 11 weeks, peak incidence at two to four months. 90% are age less than six months old. There are some risk factors like maternal or prenatal smoking, young age of mothers, nutritional defense, deficiency or sharing the bed with the infant. Infant risk factors include males, minorities, premature infants, prone sleeping position, and the use of a bunch of pillows, blankies, and bumpers. So sudden infant death syndrome, increased risk and decreased risk. So these are some things that increase risk and decrease risk. Increased risk with the ones we talked about, decreased risk with breastfeeding, pacifiers, laying the child supine, and not putting the child in your bed and not smoking. Sudden infant death syndrome, historical questions. Previous death of siblings or cousins. Assess the other etiologies, especially child abuse and metabolic disorders. Previous events of cyanosis or apnea. Who was the caretaker and get a good history on these kids. Assess risk factors for SIDS like smoking, co-sleeping, or current events. How do we manage this? Well, we got to try to bring these kids back. We're going to do CPR. We're going to confirm that they're not coming back. Postmortem skeletal survey. We need to check all their bones to make sure that we're not worried about abuse here. Remind family death is likely SIDS, but search for other causes, right? Non-accusatory compassion is helpful in providing religious support and support for the family as this is a very traumatic thing. Here are some references. Holy jamoli. Boy, guys, that was a good review. There's a lot of infectious stuff on there. So you probably got this a few different times. You're going to get it again with infectious disease stuff, but I am so glad to share it with you for this. And I hope that you listen to this and use your Review book as we go along, okay? Because we're all going to pass pulmonary like we all passed renal, right? All right, so let's stop recording.